In the part of Proverbs that we read from this morning, we met a character, and her name is Lady Wisdom. This character puts a human face and gives a human voice to this abstract idea of wisdom. But if we get to know this character, she's going to tell us a little something about God. Because as Lady Wisdom testifies, she was there at the creation of the world. Now this part of Proverbs is poetic, so it's not surprising that Lady Wisdom is a metaphor describing what it was like to be there in the beginning when the world was made. Now, if I asked you where you would find information about creation in the Bible, you'd probably tell me to look in Genesis. That's right. But creation is open for us in the wisdom literature as well. This happens in the book of Proverbs. And some people even say that the book of Job is wisdom literature, and Job actually has some information about creation as well. So what do we learn about creation from Proverbs? Well, if we get to know Lady Wisdom, we actually learn some pretty incredible things. Now, first of all, and this probably won't surprise you, especially after the children's story we just had, but when God created the world, God created the world in an orderly fashion. That says that in Genesis as well. In the beginning, the world was in a state of chaos. Genesis 1 tells us the earth was formless and void, so it was chaotic. And then God spoke, and it brought order to the chaos. And this is confirmed by Lady Wisdom's testimony, who tells us, when God marked out the foundations of the earth, I was beside him like a master worker. It says in the NRSV, other translations offer, I was beside him like an architect, or as a master craftsman. Or as the message puts it, I made sure everything he did fit. So Lady Wisdom, it says, was there as God planned an orderly creation. N.T. Wright says this, The whole creation was made by one God through his wisdom. That's what Proverbs 8 has said starting a line of thought that was developed by Jewish thinkers down to Paul's own day in the New Testament. It began to be sure as a metaphor. To speak of Lady Wisdom as God's handmaid in creation is a poetic way of saying that when God made the world, God's work was neither random nor muddled, but wise, coherent, and well-ordered. It made sense. And of course, that is the point of the book of Proverbs as a whole and later literature that echoes and develops it. If you want to be a genuine human being, reflecting God's image, then you need to be wise as well. You need to get to know Lady Wisdom. So get to know Lady Wisdom, Proverbs urges us, because if you do, you might learn a little something about the way the world works. And when we learn about how the world works, it tells us about our Creator, the way that God ordered creation is one of the ways that God demonstrates how much God loves us. When we see the sunrise day after day, when there's birth and growth, the water cycle, newness in spring and leaves turning color in the autumn, all of those things point to the order of creation. The world works. Gravity keeps us on the ground. Seeds grow even though we don't know how and we can't see it. Babies are born, the sun rises and sets as the world goes around the sun. All of that is the orderliness of creation. God is an architect who in love designs an orderly world, and Lady Wisdom tells us this tale. One writer puts it this way, Wisdom is both the means by which God created the good creation and is also the design that God built into creation God's creation is trustworthy. We so often take for granted how genuinely miraculous and trustworthy ordered creation is. The spinning spaceship that is planet Earth, a small orb of safety spinning in an unimaginably vast creation, is a miracle of trustworthy love, and it is a sign of God's love and commitment. So the way that God designed the world is part of the way God shows that God loves us and is committed to us. God's creation is a miracle of trustworthy love. What a lovely take on the character of the Creator, as testified to by Lady Wisdom in the book of Proverbs. 
but the lady has more to say. When Lady Wisdom tells us of her experience by God's side at the creation of the world, she tells us this. It was a fun place to be. Here's what we read. When I was constantly at his side, I was filled with delight day after day, rejoicing always in his presence, rejoicing in the whole world and delighting in humankind. Eugene Peterson's The Message offers, day after day I was there with my joyful applause, always enjoying God's company, delighted in the world of things and creatures, happily celebrating the human family. This connection with joy is made even clearer in the language of John Golden Gay, who translates these verses like this. When I was a child, I was by his side. I was full of pleasure day by day, having fun before him all the time, having fun in his world, in his earth, and full of pleasure in humanity. Can you sense the happiness, the delight, the celebration, the joy in the way that Lady Wisdom talks about what it was like to be there when God does what God does, creating, bringing forth new life. It says this in Genesis 1, as well we read that after God finished creating, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. Did you ever think that maybe God had fun while God was creating? What if the world that God created bring, brings God delight and joy? Alice Walker once wrote this, I think it annoys God if we walk by the color purple in a field and don't notice. Philip Yancey wrote this reflection called, I was just wondering. And he asks a number of questions about the beauty of creation. And he thinks that surely creation was made for more than just utility because it brings delight and joy to the creator. He writes this, why are there so many kinds of animals? Couldn't the world get along with, say, 300,000 species of beetles instead of 500,000? What good are they? Why is it that the most beautiful animals on earth are hidden from all humans except those who put on elaborate scuba equipment? Who are they beautiful for? Why are dogs so much easier to train than cats, he asks. And why are African elements, elephants almost impossible to train? And what does God take the most pride in, a dog or a cat? I was just wondering, he says. Interestingly, Yancey goes on in that same reflection to wonder, why did Solomon, who showed such wisdom in writing Proverbs, spend the last years of his life breaking all those Proverbs? But the answer to that is probably more complicated than we can cover this morning. James Smith captures this sentiment well when he wrote, the world does not have to be beautiful. We do not have to have ears and eyes tuned for such sensitivities. The color green is not necessary, and we have done nothing to merit the taste of chocolate, but they are all there. Our host, he says, is an artist, an engineer, a chef, and a musician. Without any other divine revelation than what we taste and see, we know this, we are loved. And love alone is credible, says Balthazar. Everything that is, every tree, bird, star, stone, and wave, existed first as a dream in the mind of the divine artist. Indeed, the world is the mirror of the divine imagination, and to decipher the depths of the world is to gain deep insights into the heart of God. The poet, Gerard Manley Hopkins, said it best, Glory be to God for dappled things. So the world doesn't have to be beautiful. Food doesn't have to taste good. Music doesn't have to delight our ears, but it does. Doesn't that give us an indication of the joy of our creator and that God took delight in creating and creating things that pleased both God and us? Ellen Davis writes this, the image of divine wisdom playing with humanity suggests that playfulness is part of the proper response to God. This is an obvious, although not necessarily common way of understanding the famous dictum of Jesus, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. 
Theology is often considered very somber business, but the picture of a divine and boisterous wisdom playing with humans implies that God's intention is quite different. Catholic writer G.K. Chesterton captures this in lovely detail, and this is one of my favorite Chesterton quotes when he wrote this. Because children have abounding vitality, because they are in spirit fierce and free, therefore they want things repeated and unchanged. They always say, do it again, and the grown-up person does it again until he is nearly dead. For grown-up people are not strong enough to exalt in monotony, but perhaps God is strong enough to exalt in monotony. It is possible that God says, do it again every morning to the sun, and every evening do it again to the moon. It may not be automatic necessity that makes all daisies alike. It may be that God makes every daisy separately, but has never grown tired of making them. It may be that God has the eternal appetite of infancy, for we have sinned and grown old, and our Father is younger than we. So playfulness, delight, joy, all of that is something that's built into our created order, into the things that God has made. How wonderful. We think that theology is this somber business, but then we have this picture of Lady Wisdom playing with people and animals and everything else God has made. And maybe we can smile a little and maybe we could even laugh with her. As Ellen Davis challenges us, how can we ever imagine the joy of heaven or testify of it convincingly to others if we cannot now discover the fun of turning our mind toward the things of God? The testimony and poetry of Lady Wisdom tells us that creation is orderly, logical, and wise. That's one of the ways that God loves all that God has made. And creation is by nature both delightful and pleasing, and it should be and was meant to be a source of joy for humankind as well. 12th century mystic Hildegard of Bingham wrote this. She said, I walked just after sunrise this morning, the sunlight slanting through the trees and onto the patches of frost on the ground. It is chilly, but not freezing. Spring is all around us, the promise of rebirth. At the barns, workers were attending to feeding and milking. There is activity everywhere. I love all the babies, she says. Even in these dark times, they are God's reminder that change continues and nothing lasts forever. Empires and tyrants rise and fall, both politically and in the church. As I greet the men about their labor and later the women in the kitchens, I try to remember that to see the face of God in everyone, in fact, in everything, from the young man who coerced our young postulant to steal, to the old healer that is now in our summer shed, uh, residing there. The kingdom of God is not some far-off place, she says. It is here and it is now. And what if, as Lady Wisdom puts it, both wisdom and God took full pleasure in humanity— as Golden Gate puts it, or delighted in the human race, as in the NRSV, or were even happily celebrating the human family, as in the message. What if God delights not just in the fish or the birds or the taste of chocolate or the color purple and green or sunrises and the moon and creating daisies, but what if God delights in humanity too? Now my answer to that, of course, was, there sure seem to be a lot of things, some days, that we could point to that God could not possibly delight in in our humanity. The way that people treat each other, the racism, misogyny, ageism, injustice, cruelty, bullying, torture, and war that we dream up for one another, or that we tolerate as long as it doesn't seem to affect me too much personally, or the way that humanity perhaps treats the earth as seen in our wildfires that are burning out of control. And yet maybe we can also see glimmers and glimpses of things that God may delight in. Deep friendship, when we pray for one another, when strangers help strangers, when parents love their children and children love their parents, when we show up for other people, when we take their part even though we don't have to, when there is hugs and laughter and sharing. 
Perhaps God delights in the genuine smiles of people who love and care for each other and in the comfort we draw from our pets if we have them and when we form community that loves and looks after one another. You know, I think God delights in every one of you. Now, Lady Wisdom might be an unfamiliar figure to you, but that was an idea that inspired the imaginations of the Hebrew people, and that inspiration continued to reach the earliest Christians as well. One of my classmates, when I took my D-Min program, uh, her name was Kristen Marble, and she wrote a book about how the Old Testament scriptures are still relevant for today. And she writes this, Remember that Paul and Jesus and the earliest disciples and other New Testament writers were committed first century Jews, and their scriptures, which we now refer to as the Old Testament, had been read, prayed, recited, and memorized for centuries among the people of God. And those same scriptures were instrumental and foundational in the life of the developing church. So given that that is the case, it is not surprising that this image, this picture of wisdom as a person, came to mind when the writer of the Gospel of John thought about Jesus. In John 1, we read this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. I compare that description uh, applied to Jesus to this description of Lady Wisdom. I was formed long ages ago at the very beginning when the world came to be, and I was there when he set the heavens in place, when he marked out the foundations of the earth. Now, of course, that's not to say that Lady Wisdom is a deity or a god or that she has the place of Jesus. Lady Wisdom is not a god. She's not the same as Jesus. In Proverbs, she's a metaphor. However, all I want to say is that when Jesus came along, the New Testament writers saw in Jesus this fulfillment, these things that were written about Lady Wisdom in the image that Jesus uh, gave to them. And it captured their imaginations as well. So if Lady Wisdom tells us about the order of the created world and the delight that God took in and takes in it, then the Gospel of John simply adds to that and tells us that Jesus was there ensuring order and taking delight when the world was created. Jesus reveals to us the face and the character of God, a God who loves us so much that God created the world and everything in it for our benefit and even for our enjoyment. God delights in what God has made. And if we get to know Lady Wisdom, she will tell you there is joy in creation. There is joy in knowing Jesus. There is joy in knowing God. I hope you have enjoyed meeting Lady Wisdom today. Would you bow with me in a word of prayer? Lord God, our creator, for all things bright and beautiful, for all creatures great and small, for all things wise and wonderful, we give you thanks today. Help us to see the wisdom in your created order and help us to delight in it and help us to choose to follow the way of life that is shown most fully in Jesus the Messiah, who is your Son and our Lord. Amen. As you go from this place today, may God's wisdom be the store from where your daily thoughts are gathered. May God's love be a flowing river, bringing peace to your heart and your soul. May God's whisper be a word in time, breaking through this world's clamor. And may God's faithfulness be your strength and hope within whatever storm you face. Amen. Go in peace.